for a number of uh, reasons, uh, recession being one and, uh, and federal cuts to uh, health care uh, uh, spending money to the provinces, uh, we were facing a $15 billion uh, uh, deficit debt in the province when we took over government in the 1990s. The uh, government uh, actually, we got together and at one point we were saying, you know, how do we handle this mess? And we decided to tackle the problem ourselves and we, uh, uh, we made it our first order of priority. But our second order of priority was to revamp the healthcare system. We wanted to do that because there had been a series of reports which were largely, you know, gathering dust on the shelves. Uh, and the healthcare stakeholders really wanted to see some form of reorganization. Many of the healthcare stakeholders had been involved in the preparation of those reports and wanted to. Uh, see us proceed with something. So in practical terms, what was the challenge that you were trying to solve in the short run? The challenge in the short run was to deal with the deficit. The uh, ch challenge in the long run was to revamp the healthcare system and to provide better healthcare for Saskatchewan people. And in the short run, what did that mean in terms of the hospitals and the healthcare facilities in the province? Well, in the short run, it meant downsizing uh, our acute care capacity significantly. So we converted 52 rural hospitals. They were all very small hospitals, but nevertheless, they were in communities uh, and uh, people saw their hospitals as being sort of a secure part of their community. So they were in, in, in small communities, very, very rural, but it was very political and we converted those hospitals to uh, healthcare centres. So how did you go about persuading people who were very fond of their local hospitals? How did you persuade the physicians? How did you persuade the public? How did you persuade your political opponents that this was a good idea? Well, we obviously didn't persuade everybody. And uh, I think uh, if you're going to engage in tough measures of this nature, it's really very important to just know you aren't going to make everybody happy and there will be a segment of the population that will be very dissatisfied because they're losing their, their jobs in these communities. We need to remember that in these communities it was wives of farmers and, and local workers who were actually staffing the hospitals and it provided family income for them and they lost their uh, source of income. So it was very uh, dramatic for them. Uh, and it was quite a blow to their security. So you're not going to uh, get people on side with those kind of cuts. However, we did have a process where we involved stakeholders right from the very beginning, healthcare stakeholders, physicians, nurses, other healthcare stakeholders. Also a process to involve community leaders from across the province because we set up planning groups, 30 of them throughout the province, to talk about how do we proceed with health reform to help us draft the goals, the vision, and also the implementation steps. So everyone was involved in that process. We then asked um, healthcare stakeholders, including physicians, to come out on the road with us and travel the province and have town hall meetings talking to people about what we were uh, planning to do and how it would uh, impact their community to get some input from them, etc. So we did. We had a, a, a tour of the province and we were accompanied by many healthcare stakeholders on that tour. And um, so I think, in a nutshell, it was to involve people in actually developing the vision and the steps for implementation and then to present that to the public and uh, get communicated as best as we can. If you hadn't have done that, what do you think would have happened with your plans? Well, I think it, it would have been very difficult to implement any plan if you didn't have uh, the support of uh, major stakeholders in the system. 
And we had that support initially. But it became, there were times when it became very difficult to hold on to that support as the cuts deepened and when we moved to convert 52 hospitals. It, it became more difficult, not necessarily with the leadership of the stakeholders, but with individual stakeholders in the communities that were being impacted or who had patients or clients that were being impacted. Looking back on it, do you regard the process as having been a success, at least in having reduced the deficit or kind of met that financial challenge? Well, we balanced the books after the first term. At the end of the first term, we, had, uh, uh, we eliminated the annual deficit. Uh, so it was successful in that way. The restructuring was successful in that it has endured for the last couple decades. Um, the, uh, there has been some changes to it. Uh, for example, we moved from 30 regional boards to 12, uh, which was anticipated, incidentally, in the original legislation. We talked about amalgamation of boards because we knew 30 was perhaps too many. Uh, but the, there was another aspect of the reform, which was phase two, which was to bring uh, population health, uh, primary health care with population health goals to the population. That has, hasn't been completed. It's a work in progress still today. So uh, I feel that uh, I would have liked to have seen us make more progress in that area and it hasn't occurred. The, but as in terms of the short-term goal of deficit reduction, it did, the, it, did it. Now the NHS in England, as you know, has a short-term financial challenge and is attempting reform. What do you think the lessons are from your experience that the NHS and the politicians and the people running the NHS should perhaps be aware of? Well, your situation of course is quite different from ours in many ways. Um, and so um, it's, it's really difficult for me to advise uh, your leaders. The, I do think, however, when you're looking at major changes, there are some common principles. And not to say that we followed every single one of them when we did the change, but when I do a post-mortem and I, I, I reflect on what happened, I think the main ingredients are that, first of all, you need a minister that's engaged, who uh, is inspired uh, by the vision, and who is a champion for change. I think that's extremely important. I think also you need to uh, involve stakeholders from the very beginning in drafting your vision and getting some buy-in from stakeholders and community opinion leaders, who, uh, people who may have influence in your community, in your various communities. Um, also, I believe that a reform of the magnitude that we did in Saskatchewan, because it was huge, well it was huge across Canada, major restructuring, it needs to happen early in a government's mandate. And so some of the measures we took, for example the conversion of hospitals, there, were, there was an argument around the cabinet table whether we have do it over a period of time and let the regional boards do it or whether cabinet take ownership of it and that we do it ourselves. It was thought that if we were going to succeed in doing it and get it done, uh, that we had to take ownership of it and do it up front and do it very quickly. There was concern that the regional boards may not be able to do it and that the politicians simply had to take ownership of it and do it. And that was one of the reasons we did it in that way. So was there a political price to pay for this for you? Well, the government was re-elected. Uh, it may have made a difference in some areas, but overall they were re-elected and it wasn't vote determining. may have been in some areas, but not overall. So it is possible for politicians to take these very difficult decisions and not necessarily be punished for it by the public. Yes, I think that's right.